Well, we've got a really fun topic today. I knew I would do a video or videos on the Gonzales or Gonzales line of saps. Now, I had to wait until we got to the 20th century in terms of the overall weapon timeline, but we're there. You know, if we started with the original kind of frontier colonial type era weapons and worked our way through examples up to the advent of the flat sap and the modern blackjack, you know, meaning kind of the cylindrical blackjack, then we're ready to talk about important offshoots and variations, and this is an important offshoot. It's also a particularly popular one considering how small scale the overall use of these was. In my book, I say they have a deserved cult status. Hey, there's my book, speaking of that. And that is a Gonzales sap being used in a demonstration for a 1986 Black Belt magazine article. As it points out, these were invented by Robert Gonzales, a police officer in the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, I would say around 1961. Here's the actual picture I ended up using in my book. This is not the picture from my book, but the actual digital original, if you will. And you can see right off the bat, it doesn't look like anything we've surveyed before. As you saw in the video's title, this is a reproduction made by D3 Protection, and it's very faithful to the original. So unless you can score an antique, and I have yet to uh, even see one for sale, then this is as close as we're going to get. And you can see from this picture one of the standout features, that thick, blockish cross-section. And the handle itself is thicker than the business end of most saps. And you can see where that shape works its way all the way around, kind of the right, the, like walls of the uh, structure. But then you have the telltale long tubular load emerging from both the top and bottom of the striking portion. And that contrast and combination, that's really interesting visually. <laughs> I have to say for one thing, I just love taking pictures of it. But it also gives these their unique signature look, a look all of the Gonzales models have. But now let's take a look at this one. This, by the way, recreates, you probably saw it stamped on the leather, the 415. It's the smallest of the four that Mr. Gonzales designed and built, which is funny because most saps and jacks would fit inside of this thing. So these differ highly from really like all sap precedent, not just in outline, which we talked about, kind of structure, but also in size, slash weight, and effective striking area. Look at the striking head there and along the sides. Either way, you have much more room to strike with. Room for error is an advantage that most saps and jacks definitely did not enjoy. This one does. Now let's look at the other end. Mr. Gonzalez obviously liked the nice long lanyard. We'll play with that later, but look at the tail end there. It's got kind of that fishtail shape, like a Buckheimer Jr., really. A retention aid, in theory, meant to help keep the item from sliding out of your hand. And down there you have those same hard edges. Hard is, you know, too strong of a statement, but hard for a sap. You know, the walls that we talked about wrapping all the way around it. So let's go back to talking about size. Here's kind of a typical sized blackjack. Real old timer for my collection. And look at the difference in size across all dimensions, right? Not just length. Speaking of those, the 415, hey, here's my book again. The 415 was 11 inches long and 23 ounces. Consider that a real skull crusher, an extremely dangerous jack like the uh, Buckhammer Convoy weighed about 15 ounces. I'll focus on the other models, I think, in a different video because I'm realizing this is going to go longer than my typical just looking at this guy here, which is what I normally do, of course, look at one particular specimen. And there you can really see what I was talking about with the tubular loads coming out of both sides. That's what's actually going to make contact when you strike correctly. And check that out. It's just this giant mass of metal in that pouch stuffed in there, giving impetus to the swing. It's a very large surface like we talked about, so it's definitely going to spread the impact out, which is, you know, a mercy, but then it has so much mass that it's going to overwhelm that. And then it's soft-loaded on top of that, as they all were. So it's stuffed with birdshot. And it makes for a very unique sap, right? It's almost, like I say in the book, it's really more of a traditional billy club that happens to be soft-loaded. And that load is packed in tightly, but it's still going to provide that impact diffusing effect. So different from, say, this old-timer here, right? This is an old Smith & Wesson flat sap. That effective striking area is much smaller and solid. And the lead bullet in there is probably the size of, like, a spoon head. Now compare that to this. So you're going to get a much sharper blow with any standard blackjack or sap, but you're not going to get kind of the overwhelming mass that this brings to bear. So these were quite popular in Southern California and California in general, still used there to this day actually in some places. Consequently, we have plenty of anecdotal evidence from police, retired police, that these got the job done. Not surprising, right? 
but I think I'll save that for the next video. Let's focus on understanding this weapon and what makes it unique, because they really are tremendous exceptions to the rule. Speaking of the length, <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, you can't put this in a pocket, and that's what police did with them and others, but it's so big that the handle sticks straight out. So the element of surprise and really kind of quick draw ambush ability is lost with these. Let's talk about the actual swing motion now. You lose this kind of quick snapping strike that's so indicative of our weapons family overall. Just like with other flat saps, if you want to consider this a flat sap, you can strike with the edge or with the flat, and it's definitely going to hurt either way. The edges in this case are a lot less likely to cut than normally because it's just a much wider surface area. The edges are usually just a fraction of that that we're looking at right there. So here's the flexibility. They do have uh, that property thanks to a flat steel shank, so similar construction to other flat saps, but they don't have that typical force accelerating snap, in my opinion. In fact, these act a lot like the late 19th century police clubs, the flexible ones, that predated weapons like the sap and the blackjack. So you see that snap? Time for a video tradition, a little test, and that hurts a lot. Why do I keep doing that? But it's to illustrate a point, right? There was force acceleration there. I'm not going to get that with this. If anything, it's going to help it bend away from the target, but I think it will have done its damage before that. So here's another unique thing about this. It's so big and rigid when, you know, striking crosswise, that you could actually block with it, maybe even with the flat. And that's just not a move that's available with most saps and jacks at all. Blocking is just not on the table because they're so small. A high amount of flexibility making that option even worse. Now let's talk long looping lanyards. Uh, this one is so long that it can't be used in the way I've shown in past videos where you could strike with the weapon even if it falls out of your hand. So it really is more meant for this kind of thing, presumably. But even then I have to say this is not the weapon's best feature. It feels like it could get knocked out of your hand without the retention system really providing too much of a counter. Now police officers in Southern California may have agreed because they essentially came up with this. Wrap the lanyard around the base of the handle and leave just enough out to get one finger or maybe your thumb through. You would then use it to yank the weapon out of your pocket and then just grasp it like you would any other club. And that little tradition comes via Dave of D3 in fact. He had a video explaining that. And why not a super up close look. And the look is surely part of the appeal of the Gonzales line of saps. I think that's one of the reasons they cut on, uh, I call it in the book, a noticeably muscular design. A lot of times saps and jacks don't look like weapons to the uninitiated. These would not be a case where that happens. They may not have the same outline as traditional billies or saps, but their intent is unmistakable, right? It looks every bit the bludgeon. And this is how you know it's a 415. 415 stood for fight in progress to the officers Mr. Gonzalez worked with, so definitely an indication that this was a by police, for police weapon. He used the same type of naming convention on his other ones, but we'll talk about that next time. Even though I want to focus on history more in the next video, I should mention Mr. Gonzalez actually passed away this year. And I think you can see why his personal, really private invention from the early 1960s still has fans and collectors in the 21st century. The Gonzales 415, thanks.